very much. It's a pleasure to be here and share some different ideas, kind of like Monty Python out for something completely different. This is not about technology. This is about finance. This is about how to get the job done in the present economic climate where things have changed again. You know, I worked on the first Enron case in 2002, and I've told a lot of people it's not going to be back the same way, and that's exactly what's happening with the financial crisis continuing 2008, 2011 in the Eurozone. It's just not the way it has been. So we have a financial crisis. What I'm seeing is a lot more innovation. I'm seeing folks do a lot more with a lot less, and we work in the venture capital, renewable energy project finance, clean tech arena. So we work with technology companies, we work with investors, we work with fund managers. Markets don't like a vacuum. When things change, things come back differently. What is occurring in this space is a little different. It's kind of a blur. It's kind of a blur of hedge funds, private equity funds, venture capital funds. It's not so much banks. And banks are actually going to be exiting next year in this whole area of clean tech in Europe. I had a guest lecture. I do a lecture at SIPA, at, uh, in, in SIPA in the Renewable Energy Project Finance course. And we had a gentleman come up and show 10 European banks doing most of the funding in renewable energy right now. And he said it's going to be a very different slide next year. And so what is really occurring in this vacuum is funds are starting to come into project finance. Funds are, being, are deploying capital. And that's very good because they have different metrics, and it's going to push financial sustainability a lot faster because they're pretty impatient actors. So it's never come back the way it was. That's kind of my message. But we've got a bigger picture. We're talking about disrupting an industry that's a $6 trillion business called energy. And we're talking about transitioning that to the low carbon economy. That's going to take time. You know, the global carbon footprint today is 30 billion metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And we have not reduced one metric ton of CO2 equivalent. Why? Because we're combusting fossil energy, oil, gas, coal. And so we're in the beginning of the movement toward cleaner technology, using existing technology, using fossil energy in a much more efficient and environmentally benign way. So we've got a billion vehicles out there. That's a very large sector of the energy equation. Energy is buildings, energy is transport, energy is industry. Fifteen years ago, I worked on the Prius with Toyota. That's a long time ago. And now we're starting to see better technology coming out. You're going to see plug-and-play hybrids next year. You're going to see an electric vehicle from China that has 185 miles on a charge, way beyond where today's technology is. You're going to see compressed natural gas vehicles again. Natural gas has 130 octane, so you're going to see a lot of movement there. And so all of this is going to take time. But here's the reality. We have 250 million vehicles today, mostly run on gasoline and diesel fuel for cars and trucks. And we have, we just sold the millionth Prius in the US last April, so that's 15 years later. These things take time. Renewables, which I'm a big advocate of, is only 7% of the global energy pie. It's quite small. But the better news is we're seeing cost reductions. What we say in capital markets, bending the cost curve. What you want to do is bring down technology costs for rapid deployment. That's what's occurring today in solar energy. That's happening globally, and that's a good thing. R&D funding, very slight from energy companies. I had to ask the question of many companies, why aren't you investing in your future? And it really stunned me that they're not going to invent most of this technology. They have very few venture capital arms. They are going to buy the technology. So it's basically the biotech, big pharma model. Someone else, basically an entrepreneur, a smaller company, will create technology, and the big dogs of the oil and gas and power industry will buy that technology. Kind of ironic, but that's kind of the way things are occurring. Clean tech reached its high last year, and probably be higher this year. $7.8 billion this is from the clean tech group. That's still pretty small when you start talking about capital intensive energy projects with long lead times. Uh, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, we hit $243 billion in clean energy last year probably be a little higher this year. That's the good news, but it's still small compared to a $6 trillion business. So there's a big leap of faith to go forward how to scale technologies. 
And we're talking about a massive investment opportunity. Now, the game changer would have been a price for carbon in the United States. We don't really have that, although in California today on the forward curve, you have 1675 a ton for carbon delivered in 2012. That's a big deal. That's material. Here in the Northeast, it's a buck 90. That's not material. That's not going to move the needle. So without a price for carbon, it's sort of the holy grail of moving these metrics. You're still seeing capital deployed by fund managers. And we're talking a $2 trillion investment opportunity for energy and water just in the United States. Globally, it's multi-trillions. Some of the numbers being thrown around are seven, twelve trillion dollars over the next 20 years. So it's big opportunities, lots of good science and engineering. The game really is how do you scale technology? How do you build the revenue model that can rapidly commercialize? And that's where we're sitting. So we've got three models out there. Well, I'll get that soon. So I mentioned it's a six billion dollar business. It's going to take time to transition into this low carbon cleaner energy economy. The US was built on cheap and abundant resources of energy. We have hydropower, we have coal, we have oil and gas. And because of that, we built a very inefficient economic infrastructure. You know, people talk about buildings. You know, New York City has 950,000 buildings, 40 are green. So you're really talking about the retrofit market, not particularly sexy, but bringing in energy efficient devices, energy management systems, IT, but the reality is it's still going to take time. So in my eyes, and I've worked in this sector almost 40 years, we've just begun this journey to the low carbon economy, to the clean energy economy. So how are we going to get there? Well, there are three different models for capital. Venture capital, VC, looks at up to 10 year lockup periods. That means Investors don't get their money out to, for up to 10 years. And we're looking at many technologies here, all renewable energy. We're looking at distributed energy, which is small scale projects. We're looking at energy efficiency. We're looking at environmental technologies. And we're looking at what Silicon Valley knows very well, IT technology. IT is a part of that equation. It's the smart grid, which just barely getting going. It's energy management systems and how to use building envelopes. It's demand response systems. But the better news is, with the small amount of renewables, the dispersion, the deployment is growing globally. Wind is mature today. Large scale wind projects can be bank financed. There's not a problem there. With solar, now we're seeing a wave of solar innovation coming from Europe, US, China, and a lot of that's going to be deployed in the United States. Why? Because we have incentive programs in 29 states called renewable portfolio standards. So these are state level incentives driving investment interest, driving deployment of technology on solar energy, both rooftop and ground mounted. And in the Mojave Desert, you see large scale solar deployment. California, which is the leader on solar energy, has a 33% renewable portfolio standard by the year 2020. What that means is that utilities will need to either produce or buy that amount of renewable energy. And if they don't, there's a financial penalty. Because without the teeth of financial compliance, you don't get there. So this opportunity is not one dimensional. It's many different technologies. There's also migration from the medical sciences, the biosciences into, into energy. There's lots of opportunities in this sector. So where we sit is the 10-year lockup of VC. Solar, tidal, hydrogen, clean coal, fuel cells, cellulosic ethanol, and of course, my favorite, the over 200 algae companies. I mean, you have to look at you know, buying this, building this stuff, growing it, and then putting it in a gas tank or a power turbine. That's a 10-year lockup. Hedge funds are very different. We tracked about 90 green hedge funds over the last several years, beginning in 04. And hedge funds are traditionally traders, arbitrageurs, looking for market inefficiencies called the spread, looking for arbitrage. And they're trading carbon. They're trading renewable energy credits. 
What you don't know, in the U.S., we have 38 established environmental financial markets. No one else has that. And that's NOx, SOx, carbon, renewable energy, even water. What's happened, though, because of the need to capture these environmental attributes, they've gone into project finance. So hedge fund managers, who traditionally are traders, they sit at a screen and they're doing buy sells and call options and everything else, are building things. So they're building biorefineries, coal gasification plants, wind and solar. Not a traditional opportunity for hedge funds, but because this is a different model, they're into project finance. And there are a number of them doing this and there are about three that are over a billion dollars in assets under management. So we're not talking very large funds, but a lot of movement here. Finally, we have the big dogs, private equity. Private equity funds, there are 4,000 of these funds in the New York metropolitan area. I spoke at a Dow Jones private equity conference a couple of years ago, and I never heard of any of these funds, and they're running five, 10, 20 billion dollars. So it's not BlackRock, Blackstone, Carlyle Group, it's many others. In the Bay Area and San Francisco, there are over 2,000 of these funds. So there's no shortage of capital to deploy in this sector. And what the private equity funds have done is sort of similar to the hedge funds. They've invested in wind farms. They've invested in solar farms. They've looked at run of river hydro as well as large scale hydro. They've looked at geothermal opportunities. So what you're seeing is a lot of movement of capital that is sitting on the sidelines, doesn't understand the sector of clean tech renewable energy very well, but starting to deploy capital as this financing vacuum occurs. And next year, as I mentioned, European banks will not be deploying a lot of capital in renewable energy or clean technology because of the financial crisis in the Eurozone. That's a problem. So what's occurred, I call it blur. Basically, the new green business model is a deployment of lots of capital into projects, renewable energy projects, clean technology projects, IT projects, and managing to monetize these environmental attributes that they want. So we have here in the Northeast the acid rain program, SO2, sulfur dioxide, market-based solution that was remediated through markets. Today we have an acid rain problem on the West Coast, unfortunately, because of coal burn in Asia. But the point is, that's a market, and next month, well, we're not in December yet, in January 1, we'll see more stringent air quality law because the EPA will move forward, and guess what? The dysfunctional Congress won't stop them. So we'll see more stringent air quality regulations for both SOX, acid rain, as well as NOx, ozone, urban smog. And that's a good thing. So folks are buying these environmental credits. Carbon credits, CO2 equivalent. About 84% of the greenhouse gases are carbon. So we use that metric you heard before. N2O is 310 times the carbon intensity. Methane, CH4, is 22 times the carbon intensity. So there's been a lot of activity in methane capture and destruction. And you're probably aware that the oil industry still flares gas. That means they burn it as they're producing oil. Very bad idea. We want to capture that carbon. But that creates another fungible commodity. The carbon market, still pretty small, about $140 billion globally, dominated by the EU emissions trading scheme. U.S. carbon market, sad to say, is about $2.5 billion, very, very tiny. But we have the beginning of the market in California. California will have stringent reductions in CO2 beginning on January 1st, 2013. So it's kind of a scramble of bringing better technologies into California. As you may know, California does not have any coal burning plants. And 50% of U.S. power generation today is coal fired. So the game is to shift that to less carbon intensive fuels like natural gas or move it to the free fuels of renewables, the sun and the wind and the tides. Another market where we're very involved as uh, these uh, hedge funds and arbitrageurs are water rights. Water today is priced at a penny a barrel globally. And there are 42 gallons in a barrel. 
very underpriced resource. The energy complex uses 15% water for many of its projects. So that's another market where you're seeing these environmental attributes captured. Then we have something called species banking, wetlands mitigation. Same thing, the funds want access to land, remediation, and there's a, there's a market there for $3 billion market, maybe $10 billion in a couple of years. So what does this do for investment? It has a great impact. It reduces the cost of capital, it increases the, uh, the returns, and reduces um, and returns on investment. And more importantly, we're starting to see funding from non-traditional sources of capital. More recently, we're seeing pension funds step into this renewable energy clean tech space. Why? Because their actuarial tables need returns. And a lot of the projects I'm describing are giving mid-teen returns, 14, 15% on an annual basis. They're starting to step up to the plate and bring capital in the market, as well as insurance funds. So what is occurring is not the traditional bank financing. You're seeing more capital available being deployed, chasing what I named environmental alpha. This is a new idea, and folks are starting to follow the yellow brick road. They're moving forward. So I came up with this idea 10 years ago, which I call the triple convergence. I know people like pretty slides. It's the reduction of greenhouse gases. It's the deployment of more renewable energy and the trading of the renewable energy credits. And then the very good idea that Amory Lovins came up with many decades ago called the negawatt. Many people think that's a typo. Uh, energy efficiency. These are more in its infancy as fungible commodities, but the same idea. This a triple convergence is moving the needle forward. So the bottom line on this is with all these capital constraints, with the inability of exits for the IPO market for clean technology, and the need for larger amounts of capital to scale technology, you're seeing more innovation. You're seeing these renewable energy credit incentives move the needle forward. A lot of movement in this space, both in the US, Europe, and in developing countries. One thing about technology, it's agnostic. And the technology can be invented anywhere. So lots of movement on renewables. As I mentioned before, 7% global energy production will grow. The bad news is the guys with the deep pockets are not going to be funding this stuff. Big oil, big utilities. So they're going to buy these technologies, and they've already started to do that. Very few of the energy companies have venture capital arms, but they, are, they have the ability to scale technology because of their deep pockets. And the better idea is you've got demographic shifts occurring globally. 52% of the world's population is under 30. And I've been to 47 countries in my travels over the years, and I see an environmental phenomena that's generational. You'll see more green moving forward, not just from technology, not just from capital markets, but also from behavioral changes. You know, the reason the US did, one of the reasons the US did not get climate change legislation last year was that every House and Senate committee was a World War II baby. They weren't even a boomer. And in the next five to 10 years, you're gonna see a lot of retirement of those folks and a movement of you guys, young people, into the capital markets, into the political markets on environment because there's one thing that's been forgotten, and it's the mission statement of the EPA. Clean air, clean water, protection of environmental health and safety. These are intrinsic rights, and you're gonna see a, a wave of change occurring as we move forward. Thank you very much.